Good morning, my brothers and sisters. I greet you in the wonderful name of the Lord whose love has no limits, whose grace knows no measure, and whose power has no boundaries that are known unto men. It is out of his infinite riches in Christ Jesus that the Lord gives and gives again. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you've allowed us to come into your presence and we count it all joy. O oh God, we pray that you will keep us in perfect peace because we strive to keep our minds stayed on thee. Lord, constantly remind us that although things are troubling on earth, forever thy word is settled in heaven. Give us grace and strength to face the coming hours and days. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that you will bless, touch, and heal everyone who will hear this message. May they be willing to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in these troubling and difficult days. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we lift up this prayer. Amen. This morning's message is found in a, a very familiar passage of scripture from Psalms 124, but I would like to lift up the first and eighth verses of Psalms 124, a very familiar passage of scripture. And going to Psalms 124, begin with verse one and then verse eight, you'll find these words. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may 17th Street say. And then verse eight, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. We've been here before. My brothers and sisters, the Christian faith is often misunderstood and mischaracterized, sometimes by those who are members of the Christian faith. And so as we look around us each day and we see these conflicting themes wrestling for our attention and devotion, and we're often tempted to chase some new idea, some new prophecy, some untested movement, and over the past few years, there, there has been a steady decline. And new members to the Christian church in general and to African-American churches in particular. So the question which must be asked is how and why are so many people turning away from this great gospel embodied in the life of the great church? And why are so many black people no longer connected to churches anywhere, even before COVID. Why are so many brothers and sisters turning away from the church that has been the bridge that has brought us over? The church which has been our bedrock in times of distress, our comfort and turbulence and our security in crisis. It is no secret that it is through the church that we built our first schools, opened our first store, educated our first teachers and established our first banks. It is through the church that we were able to build universities, prepare doctors and politicians and build monuments of faith. But still, our faith is misunderstood and mischaracterized. There are a few things in life that are certain. You know, the joys and the pains of life affect us all. We are not immune. Those in the church are not immune from the same things that those who are not in the church must face. But the difference between those who are in the household of faith and those who are not in the household of faith is really uh, how we confront what is in front of us. The pessimist gives up. The optimist labors on. And then you have the pessimist who given up and the optimist laboring on often are in conversation with the realist who looks for evidence. But the righteous walks by faith and not by sight. So in the face of the changes which we are experiencing now every day in the country, trials that test us and circumstances that challenge us and burdens that nearly break us, our hope is still built on nothing less then Jesus' blood and righteousness, not our righteousness, but his righteousness, and it is the righteousness of God, not ourselves, 
that reminds us that we've been here before. It is that righteousness that reminds us that maybe not in the same place and the same sort of circumstances, but we've seen things like this. We faced joblessness before. We've been one or two paychecks from the soup line. We've seen racism before. We have dealt with Confederate attitudes before. We have dealt with voter suppression before. We've dealt with wickedness in high places followed by wickedness in low places. We've seen that before, but we've also come to understand that if it had not been for God who was on our side, if it had not been God who was our help in times like these to anchor us on a rock that is higher than ourselves, there are three things that jump out of the text. This is the Psalm of David. And the children of Israel, like us, had experienced tremendous hardship and oppression. And oftentimes, um, when people come from where it is, they have long prayed for and pleaded with God to deliver them. No sooner than they get out or get over, do they forget the bridges that brought them over Fannie Lou Hamer once told us that we must learn to praise the bridges that brought us over. So the first thing that jumps out in the text is that these people in the text are very clear. There's no ambiguity. There's no misunderstanding. They're very clear about who it is that brought them over. Now, the interesting thing about remembering who it is that brought you over is because it instills in you a sense of confidence that if he did it then, he can do it again. And so for many people who are looking for excuses to turn their back on God, you know, in these days when we have, there are several new movements that are emerging throughout the land. I know one of them, of course, is the anti-intellectual movement uh, where you have these people who are trying to intellectualize the existence of God. And uh, of course, we can have that debate any day. But for some of us, we are very clear that there are things in life that we cannot prove because proof is a man-made and man-held standard of existence. But our God faith goes beyond that which can be proved. None of us can prove a mind. Because a mind cannot be seen, a brain can be seen, but a mind cannot be seen, but we accept by faith that the mind exists. And so God is calling upon the children of Israel in this text, don't forget that it was me, that I am the one who brought you over. I did it before, I can do it now. The children of Israel, right out of exile, are confronted with two directions on the one hand, the direction to go forward, on the other hand, the direction to go back. And it is a tempting proposition that all of us face from time to time when we are standing in front of tremendous challenges. On the one hand, we consider going another way or going back, trying something new. On the other hand, there are those of us who've learned in my second point to you today, stick with what we know. You know, there are some things in life that I may never come to know experience, but there are some things in life that never change. God's love will never change. His omnipotence remains the same. His I'm not giving, I'm not loving, and I'm not theotic grace will never change. All those things on earth will change from time to time. Even when I'm at my lowest, God has been at his highest. His promises will never change. His deliverance remains the same. I don't know about you, but I will stick with what I know because what I know has brought me to where I am. There are those who attribute deliverance to themselves, to their own intellect, to their own ability, to their own power. But God knows that each of us at some point will experience mountains that are insurmountable. And if you don't have the power of an omnipotent God, you'll never make it over. And so today's message reminds us to stick with what has been with us through many hard trials to be the one who has brought us 
from mighty, mighty dangerous times seen, some not seen but deeply felt. And so my brothers and sisters, the third thing in this Davidic Psalm, in this Psalm of David that sticks out um, very clear and relevant today. In verse two, we, in verse one, we find an affirmation of God's presence and God's promise. If it had not been for the Lord, it was on our side. An affirmation that it was God who was present and with us. But verse two, it sticks out in my mind because it signifies for me that the people of Israel were facing hopelessness, obvious ruin, and they were also facing doubt that anybody could deliver them from their present circumstances. And many of us also feel that we might not be able to get through our present circumstance. I don't know if you've ever felt like the waters were so deep and the waves were so boisterous that you couldn't make it over. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, the text says when men rose up, but you could also infer there when evil men rose up against us. We have seen in the life of our church, in the life of our community, we've seen in the life of our families, how evil men, corrupt people, with corrupt motives, have risen up against us and nearly broke us, but it was God who was on our side. It almost swatted us up. They didn't just want to, to defeat us, they wanted to rob us of our humanity. And so there are many in today's generation who for the life of them cannot imagine the things being as bad as they are. And you know, in a roundabout way, God has a way of disclosing to us what we need in any given time. And perhaps God knew that we needed to be reminded um, that it, we're not on our own. Maybe God needed to remind us uh, that we need to turn our face back towards him and seek him for everlasting salvation. Maybe God wanted to remind us that there was a time when all the things we now enjoy, we did not have. And so I just believe that maybe God wanted to remind us that we need to get back to the basics. There were times when we could not eat in the finest restaurants. There were times when we had to ride the back of the bus. There were times when we could not live anywhere that our money could take us. There were times that we could not work at any place our talent would get us. God needed to remind us that things have been this way before. And the difference between then and now, sadly and unfortunately, many are turning their backs on God. Just as many are turning their backs on science. In the middle of a pandemic, people are turning their backs on science. And in the middle of a spiritual pandemic, people are turning their backs on God. So the record can be believed. It was God and God alone who brought us through 450 years of slavery. It was God and God alone who brought us through lynchings and Jim Crow. It was God and God alone who brought us from the back of the bus to the front of the bus to owning the bus. And my brothers and sisters, it is God who will take us from one degree of grace into the next. David is reminding the people of Israel that it was God and God alone who delivered them. And so he opens up with a very powerful plea. It is a plea. It is affirming that yes, it is not just the hand of God that delivered, but the presence of God that consoled. David reminds them that the hand of God that delivered is the presence of God that will console. And he did it before and he's doing it even now. What do we make of the present circumstance? What sense can we gather from all that is going on in the country? Is there any glimmer of hope to be found when people are facing loss on a daily basis? Many will ask, how can something good come out of this? As I said last Sunday, something good will come from this. Many are asking, why should I believe in a God that is allowing these things to happen? Well, my brothers and sisters, I want to remind you that when we were strangers, in Egypt, it was the hand of God who brought us over. And the children of Israel would pray the Shemach and remind themselves that he gave us wells 
we did not dig. He gave us vineyards we did not plant. It was God and God alone. And many of the faithful, if they were here today, will testify in the way that a theologian might not clearly articulate. He's been bridge over troubled waters. He's been hope for every tomorrow. He was food in a barren land. He was a doctor in a sick room. He's been a lawyer in a courtroom. He has been a friend who stuck by closer than any brother. What can we make of this? What we can make of this is that if the record can be believed, it is God and God alone. Verse 8 summarizes the whole meeting of the assembly. Our hope is in the name of the Lord. And it's interesting that David did not merely say our hope is in God, but he qualifies it by saying our hope is in the name of the Lord. That name that is above all other names. That name at which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It is the name of Jesus that will put demons and devils to flight. It is the name of Jesus that will cause dungeons to shake and chains to fall off. It is the name of Jesus that is a bomb in Gilead. It is the name of Jesus that is hope for the hopeless. It is the name of Jesus that will console the comfortless. It is the name of Jesus that will turn a dark night into a bright morning. It is the name of Jesus that I want to be able to proclaim with my last breath of life. And so he says our help is in the name of the Lord because presidents come and go. Leaders rise and fall. Money will fade away. Health will sometimes become fleeing. But it is the name of Jesus that will endure from generation to generations. And so he invites the people to place their hope in a name that will not fail. A name that makes every situation better. He has never seen a burden he could not bear. He's never seen a tear he could not wipe away. He's never seen a sorrow that he could not remove. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The name that called everything into existence. It is that name that is above all other names. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Who made heaven and earth, meaning he did the unimaginable. He did the impossible. He did the unthinkable. And if that name is good enough to call everything into existence, our help is resting on the name of Jesus. Yes, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest flame, but holy lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the name of Christ, the solid rock I stand. Every other name has gone to the cemetery. Every other name has fallen by the wayside. Every other name will fail and forsake, but on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. We've been here before. We've seen this before. We've cried before. We've wanted before. We've needed before. We've been sick before. We've had to bear it before. But I want to encourage you that our help still is in the name of the Lord. Our help is still in his power. Our help is still in his promise. Some things never change. His promise will not change. His word will not fail. His love is everlasting. Heaven and earth may pass away, but the name of Jesus will remain forever. <laughs>